Okay, let's go. Right, welcome. Sorry about that, some technical issues. I think it's all sorted now. I hope it's all sorted now. Yeah, I guess I have to cut that out from the start. Never mind. It's all good. Right, today I'm going to be talking about producing music. Um, I am using PreSonus Studio 1 version 3. Um, I'm not sure how that differs from Studio 2 at this point, this is a demonstration version. The good news about it is, this is a fully featured demonstration version, unlike so many pieces of music production software. So I can actually, you know, save. Wow, look at that. Save and trial version. Ableton, are you listening? Okay, so I'm going to start with some side trance and then we're going to see where the track takes us. But I'd like to get the kick and the bass sorted in a track before I do anything and I go from there. So, this is where we're at with it at the moment. Um, I've got a kick and a bass. I've already set them up. Uh, I'll go through them and explain what I've done with them to you, but it seems to be no point at all in spending the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours required to make a, a kick and bass as mint as they need to be on a live stream. That would just be an exercise in frustration for you, so we're not going to do that. But we certainly will look at the kick, and we'll certainly look at the bass too, and how they interact with each other and the mixer. So, the kick drum, I did a massive, so let's have a look at that. Um, it is nearly all done in the synth. There is just one tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of EQ. But I do mean it's just a little tiny bit of EQ. That's all. Um, it's uh, literally just a low cut. In fact, I'll show that to you now. Uh, so here's the kick. Pro EQ. I have got a steep low cut as low as it can be in that EQ. And that is everything I have on there. It's sending uh, some signal out to the bass channel, but we'll go into that later. But for now, literally everything about the sound creation is done within the synth. Um, and the thing to look at is that there are three envelopes which I've used. And we'll go into that. So envelope four, as is pretty normal for Massive, is all about amplitude. And it's pretty simple. It's an attack envelope, which is set to as short as it can be. Um, and the sustain envelope, which is way up high. That's it, attack, sustain, no decay, because it doesn't matter, because it's the sustain is so high. And the release, which is set about midway, slightly shorter. And then we have a look at um, what we do within the synth itself. So nothing is on, apart from that shaper there. The fills are off, and the amplitude is also controlled by velocity, so I can do fades in using the MIDI. Um, I've used one oscillator and that's it. One oscillator and it's a sine wave. I set the pitch way down and then I use envelopes three and two just to sweep really quickly through the oscillator pitch. So oscillator two, as you can see, is set to be a much shorter, uh, it's got a shorter decay stage than oscillator three. It's much shorter than oscillator three. And oscillator two does the biggest sweep. So that's as much sweep as you can get using one slot in Massive. Um, and that's going to make a noise. It's going to be a, the, the hard impact of the kick. In addition to that, I've set restart fire gate for the oscillator phase and move that to 90. So that will be like a hard digital distortion at the very, very front of the kick, which will give it even more impact and bite. And then oscillator 3 has a much longer decay, a bit of sustain, and uh, the release is about the same as the amplitude. Uh, so I'll show you what that sounds like. I'll solo that. That's a completely normal side trance kick drum. Nothing else apart from that. Nothing else to say. It's just a totally standard side trance kick drum. If I move um, the sustain, which is the body of it, this starts happening. You note the attack portion, though, that stays the same. And I'll move that back down. About there. 
there sounds right, I'd say. I can change, move that. See, I'm not affecting the attack, just the body. About there. That's got enough mid frequencies and it's still punched through the mix. It's got a lot of bass thud still, and I'm not messing about with the attacks. So envelope 2 would be the attack. I don't really want to mess about this too much because it can go wrong quick. You see, that actually makes it quieter. But if I go too far the other way, it starts getting very chirpy. But that's about right. Okay, so that's the kick drum. I'll shut that, and we'll move on to the bass. The bass I did using Diva, which is one of my all-time favourite soft synths. Uh, Diva's advertiser sounding like an analog synth. It doesn't. It sounds like a goddamn great digital synth. It's how digital synths always should have sounded. That's how I think of Diva. And a lot of Yuhi's other stuff, to be honest. So this is what the bass line sounds like. Pretty much standard, hey? Okay, so let's have a look at what's going on there. We have got two envelopes, a filter section, a filter feedback section, so this is, um, and then an oscillator here as well. So let's break down the oscillator sections we've got. We've got the dual VCO, which is a rough approximation of a Roland synth. Um, we've got the feedback and the filter, which is taken from a Moog. Moog? I never did, never did know. Anyhow, one of those, a, a mini Moog, that's it, a mini Moog. Okay, and then the envelope sections, that's also from a Roland sec uh, type filter. So, Let's go into some detail about the filter, because this it, it is mainly a filter-based sound. Um, you're talking about the ladder filter, so it's a 24 dB filter. The emphasis is way down, so there's no resonance at all involved. And key tracking has, is at 100%. Now the advantage of key tracking at 100% is no matter what note I play... The basic timbre of the note does not change. The filter follows the note I'm playing in pitch. So that means I can play any note and it's going to sound roughly the same sort of patch, which is not true. If you don't keep that on, it will gradually get more and more shut as you go up the key. Uh, so this is really great if you want to make a bass patch using moving notes. Uh, envelope 2, that's pretty high. I've whacked that right the way up, but the other advantage of it is it's very over very very quickly. I get the decay stage in it really really short, um, and the okay, and the, the sustain okay, sustain section really really low. So let's have a little play with that. I'll actually loop that and give you an idea of what it sounds like, and we'll play with that a little bit so you can see the effect that has. Now if I open up the, the sustain, you start getting a much crispier bass sound, and if I drop it down too low, too low, it kind of goes too snappy, too chuggy. It's quite important that it keeps in time. look at is down here let's stop that down here you're not the transient mode I've got this set to oscillator reset you absolutely if you want to do it all in the synth without involving resampling your bass sound to get a steady sound or anything like that you absolutely must use oscillator reset okay uh, oscillator reset will make sure that when you play a note on the keyboard the oscillator starts from the position you control here. So if you think of a saw wave goes down and then back up and then down, this will choose the point in that slope that you start playing the note from and that has a massive effect on how it sounds. So if I uh, start again and play this you'll see what I mean. What happened to the sound? I'm not sure that's good. I mean that's really really crunchy and I'm not sure I like it. So that's the way we work. Now for me that's the best. Uh, 
let's have a look at what else I've done in here. Uh, I haven't gone near that in this patch. Your friend, if you're using Diva, uh, use this button. Just, just trust me on this. <laughs> use, use the multi-core button. It will eat your CPU. Otherwise, um, I'm in polyphonic mode. That's to do with the release stage of the amp. So I play a note and I release a note and it tails off and bef I will play another note before it's finished tailing off and so you got overlapping notes. If I'm in mono mode, that won't happen. I'll get a click from the uh, transient reset and it won't sound so good. So I like to keep the release stage so it just overlaps audibly the next note. Um, and you can control that so you get a really sort of a continuous line of bass or you can cut it off much more quickly so you get a much choppier sound to your bass. Um, but I would definitely play with that. It has a massive effect on how you feel your bass line as much as hear it uh, and you need to be in control of it. Um, the oscillator section, uh, I'm mainly in oscillator 1 which is these controls here uh, and that is a saw wave unsurprisingly. Um, and I've also used a tiny bit of pulse wave as you can see here and look how thin I've set that. That's really really thin so that's like a spike. It's an analog um, spike I've, I've shoved through the filter there. Um, which gives me a bit more bite on the attack but I have to be careful it does get filtered out pretty much as it sweeps down um, it's just a way of getting a little bit more bite um, and then feedback now feedback with this filter is really interesting a uh, ladder filter by its very nature has a bit of resonance so it's a bit, a bit of that in there but the feedback will de-emphasize that so in effect if you are on zero emphasis and you use filter feedback, it's, a, it's equivalent to applying de-emphasis. It gives you a beefier, chunkier sound, um, it will saturate the sound slightly and just make it a bit punchier, which is w what I need. Uh, punchy is a dreadful description, but hey, we all mean something. It, it makes the sound fuller, more saturated sound, um, and I think it works well with this bass sound. So there we go. Um, there are a few more complicated effects, I have to say, with the bass, uh, but not the EQ. I'll show you the EQ again. Pretty much the same thing, I'm just using it to guard against uh, low down, DC offset, potentially stealing headroom. There is no great art to this. If anyone's telling you, you need, oh, you need to do this with your EQ, you need to do that with your EQ on your bass or your kick drum, it's not accurate. Uh, you really don't. You can do it all in the synth, pretty much. Um, I did do something slightly more interesting in guitar right though, and I'll show you that now. Let's load it up. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so this is a bit more complicated. Um, what we have here is a splitter within a splitter. So I take the signal, divide it into two, and on one of those divisions, I then divide it into two to do further work on it. So if you look at the green, we've got split B, which has got a volume in it. I don't do much on that. And split A, which has uh, amplifier and that signal, the signal that comes out of the amplifier is then split again into nothing and a cabinet simulator with a low shelf. Okay, so it's a lot easier to explain if I just let you hear it. So we'll go uh, for the bass solo. Oh man, I hate it when I do that. God damn. Alright, there we go. So if I turn it off, you see the effect it has, which is not that much. So I've lost stereo width, yeah, stereo width, that's really why I'm doing it. And kind of a little bit of body. Um, but I think that's the stereo width, but whatever, it's there, definitely, and it's not that easy to explain how it got there. And I'll go through exactly how that works in just a second. Okay, so, um, this equaliser I'm effectively using to distort the bass signal. Uh, it's not going to do a lot, there's an ultra high boost and ultra low boost, so I punch both of those up. I use a graph EQ, um, that's actually taken out of the top end, 
to compensate and then brightening again so I'm kind of doing lots of little bits of distortion it doesn't need to be stereo that's um, a waste of processing power at this point the signal is mono now we get to here and this will make the signal mono uh, there's two mics you know what? I've never read what they're supposed to be I don't think they sound anything like what they're supposed to be um, I put it onto B because that was doing what I wanted it to do and then I use this section here which is really the vital bit which is dry and air so effectively this is an unreverb signal and this has got reverb from the cabinet applied and that's the important point this is I am effectively applying a very very short reverb to the signal I'm putting it in a space and that's where the stereo width and the thickening sound comes but I don't want any of the base of that I just want the top end I want I want the the user's ears to focus on the fact that the top end has width, and I don't want the width in the bass. That's bad. Keep your bass frequencies mono. Um, so that's why I put the low shelf in, and then I sort of fill around that, get it to sound where I want it to sound, um, and then I get it to sound where I want it to sound here too. So I've boosted up the volume on one of the signals to get them to match the two different signals, the affected signal and the unaffected signal, I get them the same volume and then I use this slider here to play around with them and get the sound where I want it to be and I'll show you what effect that has. So that's completely dry and that's completely wet. Okay? So you can really hear the thickening there. It's too much. It sounds totally disfocused and weird. Defocused even. So about there, I still got the snap down the middle of the attack, but I can definitely hear the edges of my, my hearing. This thickening effect going on. But you kind of lose track of that when it's with the kick drum. You can't really hear it unless you know it's there. But the effect you can hear if I turn it off. That's way bigger with it in. It's quite funny. So let's look at the. Uh, that's that, that effect basically. Now that takes a bit of playing around. the uh, kick and bass section done I would say uh, now we're going to move on to other things and see what else we can get done in this session uh, I'm going to work on a bit of percussion and then maybe I'm going to work on a few leads or something like that so let's stick in a drum machine uh, we need to find a sample but we'll get there with that 
I really like this browser system that Presonus has going on. Um, to me, it makes a lot of sense. I'll jump into files. There's all kinds of files in here. I just want a simple. That'll do. Okay, we'll do it the other way. I don't these tips. I want impact drums, that'll do. Perfect, in fact, sounds. Give me a. Okay. That on B1. So we have a clap rather than a snare. Yeah, I'm not a mad fan of that to be honest, but whatever. It was B1, wasn't it? Could use a little bit of um EQ definitely. Yeah, I'm happy with that. You note that this instrument has multiple outs, so I can choose what channel this goes to here. That's fantastic. So I can also load in my hats and I don't have to think about getting all different channels. I can just have one drum machine and program from one MIDI part to sort out things like hi-hats. So, what's hi-hat? Put that in. Why not? We'll run with suggestion we'll go with an open eye hat but that's another close eye hat and an open eye hat and we'll make these stereo too so we'll have a channel for all our hats stereo two stereo two perfect And we'll go with our standard offbeat open hi hat. <laughs> yeah, zoop. Uh, that's what happens if you don't use samples for your kick drum and you synthesize it. Every so often you'll stop the track and you want to release the note and you get a strange noise like that. I quite like it. Again, don't do too much processing. The golden rule with all of this processing is less is more. That sounds about right. A bit of delay can help though. So we'll put in an analog delay. 
gonna help if I put that into the right channel. This is one of the built-in delays. I have to say, I like it quite a bit. Uh, that sounds about right. So I just put in a, um, delay on that to give it a little bit more space. Um, I could also use the reverb, but reverb on hats is pretty hard. It doesn't always sound that great and it kind of distorts everything if you're not really, really, really careful. So I tend to not put in um, reverb on my hats or very, very subtly. I'll try and give you an example of that to show you what I mean and why I'm not a mad, mad fan of that. Uh, so I've already got a reverb set up here. I've forgotten about. Damn. Anyhow, here it is. I've used Guitar Rig. I use Guitar Rig a lot for a lot of different purposes. And I've used Reflector. Um, it's one of the preset Reflector patches. It's a cathedral and it's uh, the longest one that came with this version of Reflector. So that's Con and Dom. I'm not, I won't reload it. It takes forever. It uses a fair bit of power. So just bear that in mind. I would. And we'll make that uh, stereo, obviously. Very strange. Okay. And to use that, we have to jump here, go to our sends, and send it to the FX channel, FX1, which is what Guitar Rig is on. That's not doing that thing. That's just making my mix money. That's bad. Okay, so we got a little drum loop. And maybe uh, we'll change that for when there's a fill. So there's a fill at the end. Um, we'll separate our share copy so it doesn't go to all of it. And I'll jump down into here. I'll do my... I'll leave the first half of the bar untouched. I'll duplicate that. And then we'll do it for every kick drum. How's that? Maybe something? I don't know. So this is this is my drums. I'm going to read this and that. I'll call it drums, and I'll try and keep a lot of um my drums in the one channel. It just makes it easier to program, especially if you're trying to do MIDI. You've got like ten different channels for your drums. It's ridiculous. Not inspiring. It turn you off straight away. So let's get another synth. Uh, let's go back to massive and start programming what might be. A so I'm going to make a background synth lead here. Um, G. I'll try and make a one bar pattern. You never know what's going to come out. Sometimes you bang, bang it straight away. But it's other times it can be uh, you're here for two days trying to get a one bar pattern down. There we go. I knew it was something weird. Let's hear that sounds. Yeah, I'll go with that. Duplicate, and I'll do variation. So this is the easy way. This is making MIDI do something. So I'll come up with, basically, something that would roughly work. And now I'm going to modify that and start generating ideas out of it. 
And this is how I work with MIDI. So I goes, um... So it's easy to say, but this is how the, I write tunes, anyway. some I'm gonna try and do some glide stuff get that going See if we can get that going there we go too much too little maybe a bit too much but it'll give us a thing to be getting on with. Yeah, that's all good. Not too much. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, oh. 
So I've got it at a, at a point five. I take at a point six. And I touch it. To at a point five. It makes it more complicated. Gives you a more complicated signal. And that will benefit from reverb. Maybe. Well, at the end, to emphasize the uh, fill we got going on. A little cordy thing. Let's use Massive again for that. I've got to say, I've got a lot of none of instruments since um, Absinthe and FM8 are Massive. And Reactor, I'd have to say, although I'm not sure where it is on that list, but it's definitely in there. Um, but the Synth I use without doubt more than any of them, massive. And then directly after that is Diva. Um, these two synths, are either of these two synths, I could come to be right, be tuned with and have. Um, they're fantastic, the pair of them. They really are all the synth you will need. Um, more is always good, don't get me wrong. But these two together have got everything you need. Diva's filter. Um, with masses, oscill massive oscillators, Ooh, that's a that's a lot of power. Um, they're capable of pretty much anything. Uh, the one thing I'd say about Diva, wish it had more envelopes. The one thing I'd say about Massive, wish its filters were just a bit better. But um, between them, they've pretty much got it covered. Uh, okay, so yeah, a little cordy thing at the end to sort of give us our eight-bar structure. Uh, I've got to say, you may need an 8-bar structure in trance, but you definitely don't need it in anything else. And in fact, it can be a disadvantage to tie yourself into working in 8-bar structures, or 4-bar structures, or whatever. It's just limiting, and not in a good way. So let's try and get this on. Um, I'm gonna, this is going to be a slow attack chord. And that's way too high. Don't know why I did it that high. Whatever. But it will do. Um, there we go. So I'll push that up. Doesn't even go back to where I want it. It's already getting there. Maybe I don't know. Let's do something else. So, uh, we'll try and make this a bit weirder. I'll go Sonic. I'll choose a different wavetable basically. Sounds completely different. I'm going to do some loop work here, so this is going to sound repetitive for a bit. Maybe wondering why on earth I've chosen that. You will see. If I'm using the right type, I think I'll be soon find out. I did not know you could do a massive. Should we make this friendly yet?
Let's try something else. There you go. It can be difficult to get a good sound, but you just have to keep on playing around until it gets better. There's a delay on that. I want it for delay. You just have to keep on going, and it will get better. And I think that's where we'll leave it for today. Um, next time we're going to expand out the structure of the track. Um, that's a great, nice little loop we got going, uh, but it's certainly not a finished track. Uh, 45 minutes roughly in. Seems like a good place to stop to me. Um, hopefully next time will be maybe tomorrow, maybe the day after. I work nights, time is short, such is life. Um, but hopefully within the next couple of days we'll get another 45 minutes of an hour up. We're going to start expanding out section, start trying to make it into a track rather than a uh, nice but useless 8 bar you, 8 bar loop. And hopefully I'll be able to talk by next time. I must apologise for this, the state of the mic. Um, I need to sort that out. Next payday, hey. Um, thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>